Hi everybody, we're um, shortly about to begin the second session of NMCI. We'll just leave it two more minutes to let people join because I can see people are coming in. You are very welcome to this panel on decentering consensually non-monogamous whiteness. Okay, it looks like most people are here now, um, so welcome to you all. Um, we've got a fascinating discussion from our three panelists for this session. Um, we're going to, they're all talking about different aspects of decentering whiteness in consensual non-monogamy. Um, this panel is truly international. Um, we've we've got contribute three our three contributors. I think I looked at the panels and they span the most time zones. I worked it out, and we're spanning fifteen time zones just in this panel alone. Um, which means that um, particularly for our first speaker Yin, uh, who is coming to us from Australia, it's half past eleven there so much as I would love to keep him on the call until one o'clock in the morning I don't think it's very fair <laughs> so what we're going to do for this panel is have um, the speaker present then have questions for that speaker and then move on to the next one because Yin probably isn't going to be able to stay with us so please as you've got questions going through Yin's presentation please do put them in the Q&A where we're really interested to hear them, to hear how um, Yin's work has hit you. So please, please do engage as much, much as possible. Um, so I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to turn over to Yin, who is the Chair of Race Relations at Deakin University and um, is talking about decolonial perspective on consensual non-monogamy. So over to you, Yin. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I will start by sharing my screen. I've got some slides. Yep, good. Okay, uh, so I'll be talking about decolonial perspectives on consensual non-monogamy. Uh, as Chris mentioned, um, I'm from Australia. I work at Deakin University, Professor of Race Relations. I'm a Wakaya man. A um, little bit more about me, my positionality. So I'm an Anglo-Asian Aboriginal uh, Australian, able-bodied, middle-class, heterosexual, cisgender male. Myself, I've been polyamorous for about five years, currently with two long-term intimate romantic partners in polyfidelity. I'm not an expert on this topic in any case, and I don't really like the idea of expertise in general, uh, but I am engaged and I do know quite a bit about decoloniality and I'm applying that to this topic as a interested scholar activist participant observer in this uh, area of scholarship. So there's many types of consensual non-monogamy. It's sort of the audience where I don't really need to go into detail. Here's a particular, I guess, uh, framing of it, um, which I found recently and I found quite interesting. I'm not really going to go into all of that stuff, but it is a big space and my interest is in the coloniality and the decoloniality of this, this space, broadly speaking. So we have the whiteness of CNM, which has been kind of uh, brought to our attention for some years. Um, so, for example, a study... Uh, in Europe, North America showed that CNM is disproportionately white. Uh, more recent polyamory studies included 80 to 90% white participants. Um, there's been scholarship discussing the problematic nature of CNM for people who are uh, the subject of stereotypes, class and race-based stereotypes of promiscuity, hypersexuality, and also some interesting work on the norms of reflexivity, honesty, authenticity, transparency, as kind of not so much inherently white, but as white privileges um, that not everyone is able to engage in. 
easily. Relationship talk, rationalised emotions, scripted negotiations favouring middle-class cultural norms. And then there's a question of monogamy of what, or another way of putting it, tapping into the etymology of the word monogamy, isolation of what, and therefore diversification of what in um, kind of polyamorous or CNM spaces. So sex, sure acts, romantic love, trust, affinity, intimacy, come back to those terms later, it's more favoured in my um, presentation, commitment, passion, eroticism, orgasms, arousal, limerence, vulnerability, desire, lust, loyalty, sexual pleasure, satisfaction, companionship. And of course, that has implications for what CNN, CNN is about. So importantly, we need to look kind of uh, both pre and post uh, coloniality. This is a, a kind of very brief delving into what pre-colonial histories of CNN might have looked like from what we know. It was characterised by diverse genders, of course, sexualities and intimacies uh, were very common in pre-colonial, what you could call Indigenous societies. These societies were often matriarchal rather than patriarchal. Patriarchy has, I guess, taken over, been on the rise in the last 10,000 years, but before that, different story. And, of course, we cannot possibly expect to apply modern notions of monogamy, marriage, paternity or fatherhood, for example, not to mention maternity and motherhood, um, onto those pre-colonial societies. Um, another study found that CNM is more common in horticultural societies which are less violent and more egalitarian than monogamous agricultural societies. Of course, most Indigenous societies are and were fiercely egalitarian, so quite different from the hierarchical patriarchal societies that we currently live in. So what more broadly is modernity or coloniality or colonial modernity or modern coloniality? There's different ways of looking at it. It's, it's not easy to explain um, the terminology and I wouldn't expect closed definitions of either modernity or coloniality. But there are very definite cultural aspects to our society that have implications for CNN and decolonising that. Here are some. Uh, separ separation of mind, body, emotions, individuals should treat them as separate, rationality as privilege, um, a kind of diminishing of interdependence of the spiritual, the sacred, the intuitive, the holy, and so forth. Very specific approaches to time, linear, equally distributed, constant quantity, the idea of a commodity, time as a commodity, saving, spending, performing, wasting, being poor or rich in time. The neoliberal drive to self-improvement, uh, everyone's responsible for how their life turns out, but they also need to do as they're told at the same time. So you have very specific ideas of failure and success, um, individualised ideas that kind of um, invisibilise social contexts, a strong tendency to universalism, normativity of Eurocentric values and norms, um, a kind of uh, honing in on certain truth and realities as universal and ideas of perfection and progress and so forth. Competition, big part of certainly capitalist forms of modernity um, and beyond that as well. So ideas of merit and worthiness and the context of artificial scarcity, of self-interest and greed that is um, taught as kind of a... Um, fundamental part of the human condition. Then we have illusions of modernity, such as the fact that we're separate um, from ourselves, different parts of ourselves are compartmentalised, other people, beings, land, sea and sky, and a denial of interdependence and vulnerability to that interdependence. Notions of unrestricted autonomy, kind of like um, I'm free, I do what I like type of stuff. Entitlement, merit, innocence, denying systemic violence, complicity in, and incomplicity in harm. Of course, unending growth, progress, accumulation, consumption on a finite world. And, and tropes of certainty, mastery, control that offer simplistic solutions to complex 
predicaments, I would say. Problems is probably the wrong word there. Denial of the magnitude of the challenges we collectively face. So this is a, this is a general introduction to, de- to what is modernity, what is coloniality, and also, of course, leading on to what is decolonization. What does that look like? And then how could we apply that in some ways to CNN? So decolonization is a process of interrupting Um, the satisfactions we have with the perceived certainties, securities, entitlements afforded by colonisation or colonialism, coloniality. It's about more than apologies, tokenistic gestures, redemption, affirmation, or so forth, Um, or alliance with Indigenous perspectives or peoples on colonial terms. It's it's a much deeper transformation (laughs) that involves understanding, sensing, being, um, visceral care, responsibility, our ability to respond, um, and also confronting our fears, denials, pain, and various other traumas and triggers and so forth, and our self-image, of course, as, I guess, not complicit in harm, specifically, as an example. So here are some decolonial perspectives. I would invite you to think about this in relation to CNM. So... Nothing is complete, perfect, or enduring, but all is alive, sentient, profoundly relational, and deeply sacred. We are immersed in mysterious worlds which we can learn to perceive, inhabit, co-mingle, and grow with. We are invited to outgrow the often unquestioned obligation to obey, conform, judge, and repress, which stunts our ability to express, create, connect, and play. We are called to conscious, embodied, loving, reverent co-liberation with each other, including non-human or more than human life and the spontaneous, emergent, complex, self-organising, living cosmos that we are part of. So without spending a long time on this, which we could, uh, is the very different approaches to what is real, true and actual in comparison to the broader colonial um, tendencies we discussed earlier. So t- towards decolonization means basically beyond separation, exceptionalism, beyond single stories and pinnacles, beyond consumption uh, of various th- parts of our world and different forms of organizing, including intimacies, which we'll get to, but also economies, socialities, things like debt and property, institutions, borders, nation states, social statuses, deservedness, very deep enmeshed um, materialities and socialities within our world at the moment. So it's a big topic um, and it's something to grapple with and confront, not solve as such. So decolonial futures would be about some of those things I mentioned before, different ways of relating essentially with ourselves, with each other, with nature, and learning ideas of reductionism, truth, rightness, power over, ambition, success, perfection, certainty, control, coherence, mastery, progress, virtue, validation, heroism, fame, merit, uh, entitlement, duty, and sacrifice. Very colonial modern ideas. So exploring new transformative ways of relating, perceiving, being, doing, knowing, intending, all those sorts of things. Um, beyond exceptionalism, exploitation, accumulation, extraction, consumption, growth, and other forms of human hubris, of which there are many. So what does that mean about CNN? Well, what I'm suggesting is that we reconsider, reframe, re-envisage, reimagine CNN as kind of sacred affinity. Not the only way, of course, but one form. And what I'm suggesting is that the last 10,000 or so years of patriarchal, colonial um, modernity has warped ideas of masculine, the feminine, the sexual, the sensual, the intimate, the erotic, and traumatised those concepts as they are embodied within us. And what we could do is think about sensuality, sexuality, and intimacy uh, in loving co-becomings as sacred and healing when embedded in care, compassion, empowerment, and trust. So kind of love, intimacies, uh, as more of this concept of ontological rootedness, so a kind of way of being in the world that connects us with the living cosmos. So into deeper union with life, 
rekindling erotic energy would come into the right relation with our own selves, each other and the earth. So how can CNN, CNN be part of that reconfiguration, that reshaping, co-shaping? How can we think, think of CNN as wild affinities? So wildness as a kind of juxtaposition to the captivity of modernity. So CNN could be a form of or an aspect of wild intimacy rooted in truth or authenticity and fidelity to needs, desires, feelings, dreams, pleasures beyond colonial conventions, expectations, taboos, and judgments. Wild intimacies, intimacies that have a kind of anarchistic decolonial power that touch upon the romantic friendship, affinity, solidarity, and also broader ideas of the eco-erotic earth as lover. Um, as articulated by scholars like Kim Torbear. Now, this is part of a broad invitation to sense what our hearts yearn for, our souls are called to, and our deepest longings for life beyond colonial modernity, seen through the lens of affinities, um, sexualities, intimacies, and so forth. This is an invitation really to as part of a broader uh, invitation to strive for societies that value self-realisation, needs, freedom, interdependence, care, love, connection, celebration, beauty, grief, and cooperation, or co-liberation, if you will, without institutionalised exploitative hierarchies, hoarding resources um, produced by the labour of others, but also hoarding expectations um, of relationality. So weaving networks of empowered local cooperative communities grounded in anarchy, degrowth, wilding, unschooling, permaculture, decolonization, but also myth, ritual, and ceremony that inspire authentic, creative, thriving, playful, vivid, visceral, plural, messy, vulnerable, sacred, sensuous, joyful, sensible lives, part of which would be a focus on a much diversified forms of intimacies. <laughs> And how can we think about consent in CNN? And how could we think about decolonizing consent itself? So consent doesn't equal autonomy. It doesn't equal desire. It doesn't equal arousal. It doesn't equal pleasure. And it may serve, in fact, to diminish or pervert intimacy into dissected encounters of atomized bodies, um, um, re-consenting in each instance, each flickering kind of clock time. What if we aim for a democratic, hedonistic, intimate culture with distributed potential for healing through joy, eroticism and intimacy about much more than disconsent? Beyond consent towards kind of empowered, co-determined, dynamic, embodied, constitutive, interdependent, emergent relationships. <sighs> a focus on deep relationality, essentially embedded in intimacy, healing, trust, presence, security, and compassion and passion. So what is beyond consent? How does that, how does that intersect with decolonial relationality and broader democratic hedonistic cultures of intimacy? So the challenge is really to be with, be in with the uncomfortable, the unknown, the unknowable, the unexpected, the uncertain, the unthinkable, and the imperceptible, which is where decoloniality lives on the margins of colonial modernity. Make unique mistakes in doing what is collectively needed beyond convenience, choice, or conviction. Metabolize our assumptions, our complicities, our tensions, our contradictions, projections, triggers, and traumas of modernity over thousands of years that have developed. Discern, perceive, relate, and become without narrative, necessarily without reference to narrative, meaning, identity, intellectualization, judgment certainly without with attempting not to judge, compare, condemn or justify in a rationalist, linear, certainty, control, mastery framework. All right, I think that's enough from me. I'm going to leave some time for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ian. That was so thought-provoking. It really gave me... It made me feel warm inside, frankly. I really love the sort of concepts you were talking about. Um, so it seemed to me that um, I've, I've not seen any um, questions come through from our audience yet. So let me um, 
pose one to you while they're thinking. Would you, it's, it seems to me, but correct me if I'm wrong, that CNM, you're seeing CNM as in, in almost inherently decolonial because of its emphasis on connection, or do you think that's too much of a reach? What, what, what's your thoughts? I think it's got a lot of potential to be decolonial. It's, it's sort of inherently uh, in opposition to an important part of coloniality, but I think there's a bit more we need to do to draw out the potentiality in, in, in deep relating in sacred and divine um, frameworks in, in, yeah, in really tapping into beyond the surface level, I guess, of, of, of CNM. Um, thank you. We've got some questions come through now. Um, so uh, somebody who's remained anonymous says, I see how consent could be a colonial binary. However, for me as an autistic woman, when engaging in intimacies, consent is a way to establish mutuality and safety. How would you combine the decolonial approach with neurodiversity? Well, I mean, neurodiversity is just part of getting beyond the boxed, kind of compartmentalised, flattened cartographies of modernity. So it means that everybody else in modernity needs to become much better at sensing into different neuro configurations and so that we can relate deeply and authentically and um you know with a lot of um passion and respect and responsibility to diversities of everything including neurodiversities and so i would say that if we can foster the deep relationality, the empowered cultures of intimacy across many forms of being and becoming, then we don't need to, there's no particular reason why we would need to refocus on consent in neurodiverse situations. I mean, I think there's the same problems apply to that particular expression of humanity. That's a lovely answer. Thank you. Um, I've got a question from Matthew Waits, who says, great presentation. But does this account for the decolonial homogenized societies that existed before colonialism? Did some have patriarchy, for example? It's a hard question to answer, I think. <laughs> um, I mean, it's not a, I, I'm not going to sort of try and close, close, <laughs> have any closed ants any any certainties because that would be colonial but i would say that it seems very clear that patriarchy has become much more powerful and much more ubiquitous uh, than it used to be um circa ten thousand years or before so it's not to say it's not either or it's and both but there are kind of um emphases that have become vastly different to what they were before yeah, thank you. Um, I've got a question from Maria Amato. Do you think the Eastern tradition of Tantra, not just the sexual practices, but the whole philosophical structure, um, mm -hmm. could be helpful in the decolonization that you're talking about? Yes. I don't know if I you do. know much about Tantra. Not as much as I would like to, but I think it's definitely, I feel that it's definitely um it has kind of um, contingencies and, um, I guess, uh, a kind of connections to to deeper pasts that were more decolonial, and it has that kind of spiritual, divine, sacred emphases that I'm trying to to draw out. And yes, so the answer would be yes on that one. Yep. <laughs> That's fairly definitive. Yeah. <laughs> Seeing that. Um, there's a, a question I want to finish on, but before I get to that one, can I ask you um, 
consensual non-monogamy is obviously a very broad umbrella term and it covers quite a lot of, of ways of practicing. Are there any that you feel are more um, in tune with your with your approach? Well, I think more in tune, um, what resonates more with me are, are kind of um, things like relationship anarchy or polyamory, things that are kind of... Um, that connect with more than just sex, I guess, that connect with intimacies and loves and affinities. Um, so I wouldn't say that things like swinging, for example, is is not really going to create a lot of potential for destabilising coloniality, for example. Yep, I thought that might be your answer, which, <laughs> thank you. I'm going to finish on... Um one from MJ. This was so wonderful. Any suggestions of where we could read more of your work and of those ideas and how they might be applied to relationships? Have you published on this? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going such, to? <laughs> but I do have some broader, um, uh, I do have some, you know, a paper, for example, on decoloniality that I think like I said, it touches on some of the stuff and I think it would be interesting for people. So um, someone asked about the slides. I'm happy to provide the slides and um, I'm happy for people to get in touch with me too. I mean, I, I think I put my email up, but perhaps you could pass it on and I can send you the slides and I can send you a paper and so forth. Yeah. That's brilliant. Thank you. I've got one more question just come in now which i'm just going to finish on this one um matthew waits said that you cited the uh, christian study as suggesting mm. consensual non-monogamy is associated with whiteness in the global north could this be due to problems in polyamory research in the north not reaching black populations who might be practicing consensual non-monogamy but going unnoticed for example I'm not sure if you can answer that but i bet that mm -hmm. crystal's going to be able to answer it so maybe it's a nice handover yin do you have any thoughts on yeah. that i mean i think crystal will answer it i think there's a few things going on one is you know white biases in research white biases in acceptance in communities um and biases in um epistemology as well so then so understanding when you're seeing CNN happening um, as opposed to the narrow view of what you think it is you know, from a white lens. So all of those problems, yeah. Fab. Thank you so much, Ian. That was so thoughtful and thought-provoking. It's just lovely. Um, I'm going to let you get off now because it's midnight in Australia. <laughs> I'm sure you're wanting to sleep. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I'm going to turn now to our next speaker, Crystal Bird Palmer, who's joining us from the US. Um, she's going to be speaking about non-monogamy in the Black American community, so perfect kind of segue into your talk. Um, she's a speaker and a writer whose book, The Token, Common Sense Ideas for Increasing Diversity in Your Organization, is out now. And over to you, Crystal. Thank you. Yeah, I was looking around because I do have my book somewhere, but it's okay. I'll put the title in the chat at some point so that people can get it if they want. Um, yeah, so thank you for having me. So I'm not an academic. I don't write papers, but um, I have been polyamorous for several years and I do a little bit of informal research on the Black American experience of polyamory and consensual, consensual non-monogamy. So that's kind of what I'm going to be speaking about today. I'm going to talk about the kind of American context and specifically Black Americans' experiences with non-monogamy and kind of the culture around it. So I'll give a little bit of history and then I will talk about some of the challenges that Black people um, in the U.S. feel when it comes to exploring non-monogamy. And um, yeah, and then we'll have time for questions after that. So. Um, you know, I think a lot of marginalized groups kind of share some mm -hmm some uh, difficulties when it comes to doing something that's outside the, the white mainstream norm. And so when we think about non-monogamy in um, Black American culture, a lot of it is influenced by uh, the how they've been colonized and how we've experienced um, 
you know, um, oppression in our history. So the first part that I'll think of, I'll talk about is, you know, the beginning of African Americans arriving in the US being brought over as slaves. And so enslaved people weren't able to control their relationships. They weren't able to, you know, keep up with their children or even choose who they were married with to or, or had children with. And so there was a lot of um, kind of family separation just from the very beginning of our history in the US. And so it's significant that when we think about Black families, there's this trauma that's kind of embedded in our experience of not being able to have that choice of who our partners are. You know, there's not only uh, enslaved people being paired up to have children, but there's also the slave owners, you know, raping women and, you know, kind of having them bear children. And so there's this already this, this kind of non-monogamy embedded in it and that they didn't have a choice, but they were also kind of um, doing what they were told. So another thing that happened on plantations was that um, children were taken away and, and sold to other slave owners. And so the children weren't able to, you know, depend on maybe their birth parents. And so they had to, you know, rely on other elders in the new plantation, the new places that they were. And so there's this history of being able to make those connections outside of bloodlines, you know, depending on the family that you, you have around you instead of the ones that, um, are legally or you know tied to you by blood. Another thing that happened, you know, that started with enslavement was Christianity kind of being imposed on Black American culture. So um, Christianity is still a huge thing in the Black community nowadays. So there's plenty of people who enter non-monogamy in the current age who identify as Christians. But you know, when you think about enslaved people, Christianity was something that was forced onto them to kind of like. Um, turn them into, you know, real people and not savages. So there's also this kind of connection to Christianity and Black people have been able to take the stories of Christianity and apply them to their lives. So the most common example of that is the story of Moses bringing his people out of Egypt. And, you know, so that was used as, you know, in the Bible, it's just the narrative of the Israelites kind of being saved from the Egyptians, but black people took it as a, a sign that one day they would be free, you know, that black people would 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 leave their, their white slave owners and, and become their own people. So that's one touch point in Christianity. But another touch point is the non-monogamy that's represented in the Old Testament. So King David, King Solomon, you know, having multiple wives and concubines, that's something that a lot of Black people, when they start exploring non-monogamy, that they turn to as, a, as an example that, you know, there's a man who is leading a household and he has lots of partners. And this is not seen as promiscuity or a bad thing. It's seen as, you know, taking care of your people and being kind of um, a king in your own household. So we'll talk a little bit more about the, the ways that Black people attach themselves to kind of king, kinghood and queenhood, um, you know, when it comes to non-monogamy. So that's kind of the history coming from, from that point. When we get into kind of the modern era, era in the... 50s and 60s and 70s, there were a lot of collective movements, you know, so at the same time that hippies and people were, were doing their thing and creating intentional communities, Black communities were also organizing in different ways. And one example of that is the Black Panther Party. So the Black Panther Party, um, you know, of course, they were revolutionaries. They um, were fighting against the state, but they were also providing services to the children and the families in their community. Another thing they did, they lived collectively and they were non-monogamous. So um, they lived in houses where they were able to all be together. They did political education together. They did their work together, but they also had multiple partners. Now, this was something that was still kind of in that patriarchal mode where it was the men who were having multiple partners and not so much the women, but still they recognized a, a way of living that was different from traditional, um, traditional monogamy and what traditional society expected of people. So there were um, there were movements within the um, within kind of the black liberation movements that that were tolerant of non-monogamy and, and used that as a way to defy society's expectations and to be more in touch with with each other. Um, so continuing on with the history of kind of 
Black people in America. So in the 70s and 80s, drugs kind of became a really um, impactful uh, thing in, in community. So um, there was crack cocaine, which was a different form of cocaine that infiltrated into Black communities. And this led to high rates of addiction and increased crime because it led to a lot of people getting rich selling the cocaine because it was um, very addictive. So a lot of people were buying it. There were people getting rich who were selling it within their community. And then there were turf wars. You know, um, there were gangs that were formed to kind of protect, you know, an area of the neighborhood for, you know, who was selling drugs to this area of the neighborhood. And then somebody was selling drugs to this area and you couldn't cross the lines. And that ended up in a lot of violence. And so what we saw during the 70s and 80s was kind of what we call the decline of the Black American community. So there were people who were homeless or people who didn't have jobs, didn't have money. Um, there, were, there were people who were being killed. It was mostly young men who were dying as a result of these gang wars. And so that meant that the women were doing the burden of, of working, of taking care of the house and taking care of the kids. It meant that a lot of support networks broke down. So if men and women were addicted to drugs and you know they didn't have the, the, the time or the energy to, to raise their children properly, um, there were people going to jail. So the rates of incarceration increased drastically. So that meant that family members were being taken away from their responsibilities. And children were really growing up without that structure that they that you had seen in the in the earlier times of American families. So, you know, the fifth were integrated, um, and, you know, to kind of live. Can you hear me again? Yes. Okay. Yep. Get back. Thank you. All right. So, with the um, in the fifties and sixties, with black families being able to move into the middle class, they were moving into different neighborhoods. They were able to send their children to better schools. They were more politically active, and so that was a great time for black Americans. And there was some prosperity there. And then the the drug era kind of turned a lot of that around. So, what you saw as um, healthy middle class neighborhoods turned into you know places where, of disrepair. Um, you know, people who couldn't pay their rent, and so people who were homeless, families that didn't have caretakers or people who could hold down a job, and it just depressed the, the communities across the U.S. Um, in, a, in a really terrible way. And so that impacted the way that non-monogamy surfaced in Black communities all the way up until now. And so what that means is that when you have um, a man who has children and he goes to jail, well, the mother might choose other partners, you know, to have sex with, but also other people to help raise her children. So there's this kind of community model that that turned that we that we relied on to to help raise children. So there was a lot more need for people to reach outside of that immediate nuclear family, and there was more of the neighborhood helping to raise children. So in, in and then there were there were women. A lot of the women who were addicted to drugs use prostitution to raise money. And that's another form of non-monogamy. It's you know, not technically non-monogamy, but you know, that was something that, you know, impacted their lives because they they were using their bodies and they had to have this kind of commoditized, you know, body, you know, instead of using it for pleasure, they're using it to make money to support their families. And so that definitely impacted how their children and how they saw non-monogamy and relationships as they grew up. And so that's where when we think about promiscuity in the Black American community, you know, not all of it is uh, kind of wantonness or, or people just doing it. You know, some of it was required for survival. Some of it was built in from, you know, this legacy of slavery. You know, it's really complicated. It's not just kind of like a willfulness and, and not wanting to commit. Some of it was, was for survival. So that's kind of... Um, what happened in in the in the drug era? Mass incarceration just continued is is continuing today, and that's had had a huge effect on families. So I think there's something like forty percent. Oh, I don't want to quote the numbers because I don't remember exactly, but there's a huge proportion of single mothers in the Black American community. It's much higher than it is for white single mothers. So there's a lot of Black mothers who um, raise their children on their own. But I want to emphasize that 
on their own doesn't mean alone. It just means that they don't have a partner in the house who is also married to that person. It may mean that, you know, they have a network of grannies and aunts and friends who are helping take care of their kids. You know, they also may have partners outside of the home that um, they are, you know, engaging with. And so the current state of non-monogamy in Black communities is um, that it's tolerated because it's something that just happens. So there's kind of this, uh, like I think I can I can show from the history that there's a kind of this idea that it's okay to have partners. Um, we call them friends. A lot of people call them friends, and <laughs> um, you know, and and those people do not have to have the same commitments to raise a family or to be married. You know, some of them do choose to get married and to to live together. But there's a lot of people who enjoy relationships without kind of falling into the traditional needs of, you know, this person should, you know, give you a ring and this person should have a like we should have a big ceremony. You know, these relationships happen and they're healthy relationships. And a lot of times they are non-monogamous. And so there's this um, this this just really interesting trend. If you you know look at a single mother, for instance, you know she may have what they call a baby daddy. You know, so the the parent of um, their child, who you know they obviously had a relationship at some point, um, and they may still have a relationship with them, but they'll also have a current partner or somebody who you know that they're in a relationship with now. And the interesting part about that is usually these two men will get along fine. You know, they are known to each other. You know, there's not a whole lot of drama. It's just like, okay, this is the baby daddy and this is the new friend, you know? So that's kind of known and that's also kind of obvious to the children. So they, you know, a lot of children have half siblings. And so they recognize that their parents have different partners and, you know, have been in different relationships. And so there is kind of this tolerance toward it and, and a knowledge that this is what happens. So um, <laughs> I'm going to talk about another aspect of, of Black non-monogamy that I don't think is has been really been written about. And it's this kind of um, Black nationalism that is that started in the 60s. And well, I mean, OK, it, there were a lot of it came up in the 60s with Marcus Garvey and Malcolm X. And then it has continued to now where there's this idea that Black Americans should form their own nations, form their own communities, um, and separate themselves from white American culture. And it's not based in Black supremacy. At the extreme end, it might be. But in general, it's about protecting the Black community, about bringing economic power to people in, in the Black community, and to you know kind of restoring that village model for Black Americans. So there was definitely something that was lost when schools and neighborhoods and jobs were integrated. You know, a lot of those kind of connections that Black people had were kind of split apart because now you could choose where you wanted to go. So some of this Black nationalism is kind of trying to bring that back to, to help people find that sense of community and kind of relying on each other. So that's part of the Black American experience. I think in non-monogamy, it is not well recognized in the, in the non-monogamous community, but is a strong motivator for people, for Black people who enter into non-monogamy and start exploring it. They're wondering, how can I build my village? How can I find one or two queens? And we'll talk about that term, you know, one or two queens and, and you know, grow a family and build, you know, so that's kind of another motivation for Black families entering into non-monogamy. There is also this, um, a little bit uh, adjacent to that is this Pan-Africanism and this pseudo history of uh, Black people in Africa being kings and queens. And so in the Black U.S. tradition, there's this idea that, oh, we are descended from kings and queens and, you know, they were monogamous and they had these huge families. And so that's something that we should return to. So um, that's what motivates a lot of people or that's what people use as justification for non-monogamy is this idea that, you know, there are African cultures that um, celebrated non-monogamy and had, you know, strong heads of households and people who could um, could lead a family and lead a community. So that's another kind of motivation that a lot of Black Americans have when they're exploring non-monogamy. But there are some challenges to, um, to the Black community when it comes to non-monogamy. 
one of the things that happens when you do have this ideology of kings and queens is that that's based in patriarchy. And so you have this idea that the man is the head of the household. And so the man has this uh, stereotypical you know, figure that he has to do all the providing. You know, he has to make the money. He has to provide a home for all of his um, partners. When really in the American context, you know, there are plenty of women who are capable of, you know, being self-sustaining. And, you know, that is the reality for a lot of women that, you know, they don't need somebody to take care of them. So there's a lot of patriarchy that comes from Black men who are coming into the community, who are expecting that, you know, a woman will be a woman will be subservient to them or kind of. Uh, defer to them when it comes to making choices, maybe about, about about other partners or about children and money. And so that's kind of a conflict that often comes up when we have a lot of women who are Black and who were raised as kind of like independent, I don't need no man um, type culture, you know. And so when they enter into non-monogamy, they don't, they're not wanting to go back to that patriarchal model of being subservient. They want to be um, you know, strong black women in the tradition of Audre Lorde. So, you know, that's one kind of conflict that comes up when we talk about black Americans doing non-monogamy. The other thing is that even though non-monogamy is tolerated in the black community, there is still this, um, there's low information about the spread of STIs and unsafe sex practices. And so, you know, there's a term, the down low for black gay men. And that was something because it was, you know, secretive, it wasn't, it wasn't acceptable, you know, people didn't talk about it. And it also is reflected in the, um, in the, in the heterosexual world where, you know, if people were stepping out, stepping out as a term, if, they, if people were cheating on their partner, they were less likely to use protection or to get tested for STIs. And so there is a huge, um, a huge a high rate of STI infection in the Black community. You know, AIDS is a, is a, is a huge um, destroyer of communities and Black women are, are the highest population of, of women with AIDS at this point in the US. And so um, there is this, this, this uh, lack of knowledge about safe sex practices. And there's this, um, this uh, distrust of white resources, you know, doctors and medical officials to know what is what is safe and what is not, and how to have talks about consent and how to have talks about safe sex. So that is a challenge in the black community that people think, Oh, if you just go to the doctor and ask for a full panel that you'll get tested for everything and you won't. And even for people to go to a doctor and say, I want to get tested, you know, it's still a huge taboo. So that's something that we need to work on overcoming. The other thing is because we are kind of in a patriarchal society, there's also um, biphobia and there's kind of this um unacceptance of queer identities. So of course there are plenty of black queer people who are in the non-monogamous community, but because a lot of non-monogamous black people come into it from kind of that kings and queens, you know, patriarchal viewpoint, they are intolerant of um, anything other than heterosexuality um, to a point. So, you know, black men, black bi men, black gay men, black bi men and uh, lesbian women are kind of like, unacceptable, undesirable in the Black non-monogamous community. Black bisexual women are, you know, they're the unicorns. They're the one that everybody wants because that means that the man can have sex with one woman and she will have sex with his other female partner. And that's something that is a huge expectation for a lot of Black women coming into non-monogamy is that they will be bisexual and they'll engage with the other female partners. And so that's something that I call performing bisexuality because a lot of women end up doing it without actually wrestling with that identity of, am I bisexual? Am I pansexual? Is this something that I want for myself? Because they're doing it to please their male partner. So there's definitely kind of that in the community. There's a, there's a, uh, this biphobia that's going on for men, but when it comes to women, they're more desirable. They're, they're kind of like the unicorns. They're the ones who everybody wants. And, and some women are, are feel pressure to, to be by, even though they, they have never explored that on their own. <laughs> the last thing I'll talk about. Okay. I'll talk about two more things. <laughs> um, the last thing is that because Black Americans are traditionally Christian, that means that there will be 
um, family members who are critical of their non-monogamous. So, you know, of course, this kind of underground baby daddy culture is is fine. But if you talk about it openly and say, hey, you know, I have two partners and that's looked down upon that scene as unchristian as a bad thing. And so that's really something that kind of like um, people want to avoid. And it's a really tough conversation. And up to this point, there isn't enough literature, there isn't enough websites or articles for Black people to turn to to say, hey, this is normal, this is okay, this is something I'm doing with consent. So there's a lack of resources for the Black community to kind of share why it's important to them to, to be monogamous or, or why they have that identity. It's just seen as unchristian and a bad thing. And, and that means there's more hiding and there's less uh, acceptance of it on the public on the public scale. The last thing is that when Black people enter into non-monogamous communities, they're often the only ones of color in the community. So the people who are out and the people who are you know, socializing are white people. And Black people will not, well, sometimes they will not find people who they can relate to, who can relate to their experiences and who understand kind of the questions and needs that they have. The other thing is that Black women, especially when they come into these non-monogamous communities, they're seen as exotic and desirable. And so it's another thing where they are looked upon as like, oh, they're going to fulfill my fantasy of dating a Black woman, of you know having sex with a Black woman. And that puts a lot of pressure on the women who come into these communities, of course, because then it's taking away some of their agency because it's like, okay, now all these people want you, you know, and you don't have the time or the space to decide what are my needs and can I explore my needs and make sure that I'm doing what feels good to me. So those are a couple of kind of the challenges that Black um, Americans face. So. Thank you so much, Crystal. That was absolutely fascinating. It was really um, just such an insight into Black Americans' experiences of consensual non-monogamy, which I have no insight to whatsoever. Um, while I'm waiting for our audience to um, pose some questions, and please, I would encourage them to do so. Um, you talked, I, I was really interested when you were talking about the uh, sort of intersection between um, Black identity and particularly um, sort of Black nationalism. And um, I was just wondering if there were sort of any other sort of political intersections um, that sort of affected the way that black people come into consensual non-monogamous communities. I'm really thinking, and you're going to have to correct me, but would you say that um, there's a different culture um, in different areas of the US? Do you think Southern Black experiences of consensual non-monogamy are different? Do you think it's affected by the politics of that region in, in, in different ways? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's definitely it definitely varies by region. So you think of like places with a high black population like New York or Chicago and California, there's um, more liberalism in those black communities. So there is a little bit more openness to it. But the South is a huge region where, um, you know, a lot of black people are more conservative and they um, are kind of uh, still sticking to that Christian ideal of, you know, of, of what traditional families are supposed to look like. And so there's a lot more pressure for non-monogamous people to be underground and to not be out and to not socialize um, out in the community. So that is definitely something that's a challenge. <laughs> Crystal's got some family around her. And yes, yes. There, so there, there are people around her. <laughs> so <laughs> It's 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 so interesting. It's such it's such a big interesting area, and like you say, there's not a huge number of people of color out in consensual non monogamy communities as as academics might study them, or as might you might see in the media. Um, I just I, do you think those communities are hostile to Black people, do you think there are? Th um, do you think there are things that they could do that would um, make those communities more welcoming? Or I don't know. Why do you think that is? Maybe. Yeah. So um, my book is called The Token, and it's written about. It was you know based on my experience, not only in non-monogamous communities, but also in, in intentional communities that are kind of you know 
come from kind of this this white hippie culture of creating you know communities and communes and stuff like that so what happens is that um these, these people set up these majority white spaces and so they are thinking about the needs and the desires that that they have as white people usually middle class white people and then they don't kind of come into the thought of what um other people of color would need or what you know lgbtq people would need or what disabled people would need and so my book kind of goes into this just just kind of this blind spot when it comes to different identities and so when black people come into these spaces it's not that people are pushing them away it's just that they're not set up to understand their culture to be receptive to that culture you know i think in the queer community it's a lot more acceptable to call people out and say hey this is not working for me but when it comes to race you know when people call someone out it turns into white fragility and this really emotional negative response is like oh but i'm a liberal i'm a progressive you know i love all all people and i'm you know i'm not discriminating against you and that kind of shuts down the conversation right so there's no ability to kind of explain how can this help me feel more welcome to it so that's what my book is about kind of helping people to kind of get over that hump and be more receptive to people that's fantastic and there is a question specifically asking what's the title of your book i think i think i saw that daniel put a link to it in the chat but could yes. you just tell people the title is the token common sense ideas for increasing diversity in your community so that's the title of it um and you know i loved yin's presentation i didn't get to listen to all of it because everybody was there's stuff going on around here but yeah so when it comes to yeah <laughs> i don't think i can speak to it because i didn't hear all of it but i think when we talk about decolonization, you know, there is still this mindset of a lot of Black Americans that's a colonial mindset and we have to break through that. I think, you know, groups like the Black Panthers were really um, trying to break out of that and do it in a way that felt good to them as Black people. But there's a lot of us that when we grow up, we grow up in this Christian society and the, all these traditional expectations that, you know, even white people don't follow to the T. And so it's, you know, it's kind of like, we're trying, but we're failing at something that never worked in the first place. That was in response to um, a question asking what Crystal's thoughts were on Yin's presentation. There's so much crossover and talking about the same sorts of ideas from different perspectives. It's 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 lovely to lovely to see. Uh, we're nearly at the end of your time, Crystal. Thank you so much. I've just got one last question, just from the point of view, um, thinking about a question that Yin was asked, um, that there there is a lack of research on Black experiences in consensual monogamy. You're not in the in an academic yourself. You don't work at a university. But um, what do you do? You have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, like in America, there is um, Elizabeth Sheff and she has she's a researcher and she's definitely connected and is desirous of, you know, interviewing more black people. There is Chris Smith, who is a black researcher and he has done research on the black non-monogamous community. So there's definitely people in the US who are trying it. But yeah, there definitely needs to be more attention paid to it. And the, this realization that there has to be like this cultural sensitivity to to talking to people about it. Yeah, I, w I wonder even if there's sort of um, a language um, barrier in a way that white communities use different terminology, and and so it's just not recognised as a gap in 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 understanding of, the, of what different people are doing. Thank you so much, Crystal. That was absolutely fascinating. Really appreciate your contribution. And 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 I hope people buy your book because it's great. <laughs> so um, I'm going to thank you so much. And if you I know you might have to go off as well. Um, so I'm turning to our final speaker, um, Zaina. Thank you so much for joining us, Zaina, a little bit closer to where I am. You're in Oxford. Um, yeah. You're going to be talking about distal to proximal decentering whiteness via the intersectional prism. Zaina is a psychotherapist who specializes in race, ethnicity, and GSRD, that's gender, sexual, sexuality, and uh, relationship diversity. 
even though I stumbled over it, that is my, I really like GSRD. I think it captures everything. So I like seeing that. Um, so I'll turn over to you now. You've got some slides. So if you're ready to present, go ahead. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are um, around the around the globe. Yes, I'm here in Oxford. And uh, so not necessarily so far away, but it's that just that moment after school run, etc. So um, hence the head mic. Uh, <laughs> so I have got some slides to show this afternoon. I'm quite happy to share my slides with people. My email address is on the slides. So please do. You can either follow me on Twitter at ZR Therapy or email me at zaina at therapist.net. So I'm going to hope that this all works um, because, you know, technology. Um, and we all should be kind of used to this by now. <laughs> in that we've all spent quite a considerable time um, being at the end of a camera. And I know for some people, it can kind of feel a little bit disconcerting to maybe hear a bit of a disembodied voice over slides. So I'm going to try and, and whiz through them. So this is a little bit about me. I'm the intersectional therapist and consultant. I'm also a uh, co-host of the podcast Beyond Monogamy with Zaina and Jonathan. And plug, plug, we had a new episode out last week with Jessica Fern on uh, their book, Polysecure. It's available on all good podcast places. Um, so I specialize, I've always specialized really in the GSRD area. So LGBTQIA+, uh, CNM polyamory, Vet and kink and all of my clients come from the, the same community that I belong to. Um, I'm a bisexual multi-heritage female and that kind of means I get hit with, with quite a few intersectional sticks. So uh, why did I call, oh hello, there we go. Why did I call my presentation distal to proximal? So distal is away, proximal is towards. And sometimes when we're pushing things away, we're using language that push maybe people and communities away. We're having that selective inattention. So something is there, but we're not necessarily paying much attention to it. We all exist within a social cultural paradigm. We can't avoid it. And that fear prompts people from the, uh, the global majority. And I'll talk about my use of language in a moment that that fear causes us to code switch, it causes inauthenticity to self, and we end up pivoting away from what I call the centered self. For so many people, they think, oh, well, to, be, to, to center oneself is to be self-centered, and actually it's a completely different thing. So why is decentering whiteness important? So every relationship should be about equity. So, Equality is different to equity. Equality is about removing barriers. Equity is, equality is about not having barriers, whereas equity is about removing them all. So everybody is equitous. Everybody is equal. So whiteness is usually the default in CNM and in many spaces that I inhabit. And that intersectional othering is, is like the invisible tax of the global majority. We don't notice it, it's always existed the same way and it's very difficult to change. And this unseen difference can be a receptive area for projection, for discrimination. You know, in these figures are the UK, so I, you know, bear in mind that they're maybe not transferable to other countries. But in a group of about 4,000 people, 50% um, white people mix 50% less than maybe they should given their topography or geography where they live. Multi-heritage people are the fastest growing ethnic minority group in the UK and in theory should, be, should have been the largest group from last year. I don't necessarily think the figures have been updated so I guess we need to look at research in the UK as well as everywhere else around the world. So we have these kind of socio-cultural effects of, of the narrative. And when it's intersected with race and ethnicity, not only does it cause this kind of fantasy tick list of, oh, wow, you're, you're exotic, we'll fetishize you, we will treat you as a novelty, but also we'll gatekeep you away from any actual uh, power to be able to make any changes. And that's what Crystal was talking about 
um, you know, we will put you on a pedestal and look at you and think you're very pretty, thank you very much, but we won't actually allow you to step in spaces or to be safe and brave within CNM spaces. Within CNM, despite the ratio, you know, we really have an opportunity to deconstruct and rebuild a relationship structure outside of this colonial narrative. And one of the big things on this, and thank you so much for putting this on today, is because visibility is key. You know, I like to think it's not necessarily a glass ceiling, it's usually a concrete one. And we need to be able to get above it to obtain equity. You know, there is this monocultural default in CNM, and that needs to be constantly challenged. There is also an ex exclusion. It's exclusion based on, on parentage, based on financial, based on travel in the UK, for instance. Lots of the events take place in London. I live in Oxford. Um, so there's lots of events that actually you might be excluded from and therefore excluded from the community as a result. When we look in and we need to consider the intersections of global majority, so we need to look at microaggressions, so also micro, micro insults and uh, micro othering. We need to look at minority stress. We need to look at code switching. We need to look at the racial inequality. And all of these things are psychologically damaging to people of the global majority. They result, when we have selective inattention to them, in discrimination in bias, in psychological distress, in reactions instead of response. We can have communication difficulties both inside our cules and outside of them and have these unforeseen status exchanges. So I use two methods of getting into this and trying to reframe it. One of them is Sullivan's South System. So I've got a lovely slide next that people can really geek out on. Um, but it's because I like diagrams, what can you say? But it's that, it's that part of us which actively protects us from information that would cause us to reevaluate our pre-existing self-perceptions. Quite often, those pre-existing self-perceptions are socially conditioned. They are what I call our inherited self as opposed to our evolved self. So the self system is an interconnected network of beliefs that helps a person to make sense of the world around them and decide what goals and tasks to pursue. What happens and what gets in the way when maybe we have a negative self system is something called a Moore's paradox. Now, a Moore's paradox is something that is a tendency to believe false things on the understanding it comes from a knowledge of justified true belief. It's that friend of yours who always will disagree with you on purpose. I try to use real world examples to explain the issues that that's encountered in the world. And I had been expressing to a friend that some of the people they associated with had maybe equity issues when it came to my intersections. So sexuality, gender, race and ethnicity. And it, it so happened that on a night out, all of this was demonstrated, unfortunately. Not a great experience, but what it did lead them to was it led to confront their own Norean paradox. What they said to me was, I knew you were right, but needed to believe you were wrong. Rationally makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. But this occurs again and again throughout our society, where we are confronted with something that challenges our self system, and then a Moore's paradox pops up around it. If we look at self system, Moore's paradox, we need to look at selective inattention. Selective inattention is a prolonged or chronic lack of perceiving a, a particular stimuli. So there was, my friend had some selective inattention of me going, mm, I think your friends maybe aren't as great as you think they are. So they had selective inattention to it. But we also need to bear in mind neurodiversity. So in neurodiversity, uh, processing both cognitive and executive functioning, there is differences. Everyone within your cure will process things at a different speed. 
So what we need to remember is we might be on one page, but actually somebody that we're in a relationship with might be on a different page. And we need to wait for that. There was also a time when I was in a club and, and with a friend of mine and they said, you know, I've gone to this club lots of times. I've never had an issue. This person identified as white. And by the end of the evening, they just looked at me and they said, I get it. And that's actually all we want. That's all we need is for people to be able to get the experience that we have in so many topographies throughout our lives and not just CNM spaces, despite the fact it's maybe more monocultural than most. Now, I'm a psychotherapist and the UKCP, which is my accrediting body, has 3% of therapists who identify as not white. 3%. That percentage goes down even further when you look at people who specialize in LGBTQIA plus or GSRD. If you look at people who specialize in polyamory, CNM, non-monogamy, FET, kink, there aren't many people in the profession doing what I do or working in the area that I do. If we're not considering these things, we will get things like racial gaslighting. One of the worst things you could ever possibly say to somebody of the global majority is, I don't see colour. You need to see colour. You need to acknowledge colour. You need to recognise that a structurally embedded advantage exists purely based on what colour you are. So this is, the, this is the geek out slide, which I will gloss over, but please do email me if you want to have a little look at it. So this is Sullivan's interpersonal theory. This is level two and three. Level one is, is slightly simpler to understand. These are the emotions that we go through. This is what we project to the outside world and how we can begin to reframe them, how we can get around using language, to make sure that people are understanding and knowing where we are, but also that we can move forward as a community, which is vitally important. <laughs> Bringing things proximal, distal, it's all far away. So how can we bring them proximal? Well, we look at something which is uh, something that I teach called cultural sensitivity, but we also look at the evolution of terminology of intersectionality itself. So the Oxford Dictionary uh, defines intersectionality as uh, the interconnected nature of social categorizations. So race, class, gender, there's some more on, on your screens for you, regarded as creating overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination and disadvantage. Now, our intersectional prisms are, are multi-layered OK, we don't just have one of them. And I would I always encourage people to look at these diagrams and think about how many intersections they personally have, bringing it proximal once again. It's very difficult to think about when you're thinking about it distally, when you're thinking about it around somebody else. I've changed the language that I use around this conversation. The P word, privilege, kind of my Macbeth nowadays. And that's because I use the phrase structurally embedded advantage. Now, most people can break this down. Structure. In therapy, we talk about container principles. We talk about the scaffolding on our house, if you're thinking about Freud. You're the house. The scaffolding around you either closes you in or opens you up. It's the structure that is the intersectionality, not necessarily the things that overlap for you. Embedded. Anybody that's done anything on a website will know how to embed something. It's something that's taken externally and put into something. So it's intersectional oppression. It's patriarchy. It's all of the words that people, their self system comes up, they will create the Moore's paradox, or they may actually resurface one that's conditioned, and you end up walls up. Nobody can talk to each other. Nobody can communicate with each other. So using a phrase like structurally embedded advantage, instead of privilege, 
already you're beginning to circumnavigate something that might get in the way of conversation. You may have heard me use the phrase people of the global majority instead of POC or black. I'm not black. I'm multi-heritage. And quite often, even I've experienced the feeling of not being black enough to be black and not being white enough to be white. So I use people of the global majority. Not only are we the global majority, but it means that I'm then not using terms that I'm uncomfortable with either. So how can we decenter whiteness in our cules? Now we've thought about our own intersectionalities. Now we've thought about what intersectionality is and begun to use differing language so we can bypass the South system and Moore's paradox was why I came up with the REM. And the REM is the Relational Ethnicity Map. I didn't realize it, it made the acronym of a fantastic band when I made it, but I was quite pleased that it actually does. Um, and that some of you out there are going to be having REM earworms for the rest of the day. I genuinely apologize. So in CNM, it is incredibly important to keep in our peripheral vision. So, you know, we might have something that's really important right in front of us, but to keep in our peripheral vision, that love in whatever form, so whether that's a QPP, a queer platonic partnership, or whether that's sexual love, physical love, aesthetic love, should always be complementary, never ever competitive. Sometimes it can be in, in polycules or triads or whatever setup that you're using for CNM. This should be something that is used by everyone to sit down, to have those open and challenging conversations and, you know, ask questions. Never make assumptions. I say this with clients all the time. If you, you're assuming through your own lens, listen to somebody else's. Be upfront about your, conditionally, uh, your socially conditioned stereotypes. We'll all have them, you know. Be upfront about them, challenge them, change them. Find emotional support from people. There's some fantastic Facebook groups that deal with kind of intersectionality and CNM. Find support there. Talk about your own intersections and know yourself. That's the key to cultural sensitivity. It begins with self. Look at the historical and intergenerational trauma that any partners might have experienced or be experiencing now. Confront and challenge the racial inequality in your relationships. Look at status exchanges. Look at racial and ethnicity-based stress and trauma. It's incredibly important. Something around intergenerational trauma could be around where people go, oh, well, actually, you've, um, you know, why are you not over slavery? And this has actually been said to me. And, and I always bring up the fact that if you paid taxes in 2015 in the UK, you were still paying the interest off on the payoff given to slave traders. So when people go, oh, slavery ended a long time ago, the financial aspect of slavery and therefore the intergenerational trauma of it actually didn't. So I'm going to take, this is, this is my, well, actually, I've got one more slide that's got my email address on, which you would have seen. If you want these slides, I do give them out, but I ask if you use any of the ones that I've originally designed, like the REM, that actually you, you credit me if you use them anywhere. Um, so you can get hold of me at zaina.net, that's my website, Twitter at ZR Therapy, and uh, you can email me at zaina.net. So I'm going to find my keyboard and do this, and then find the screen and stop sharing, and then I'm back again. And I, and I wanted to come back quickly because I wanted to tell this story, and it does come with a warning. Okay, it comes with a warning because there is language used in this, in, in this in encounter that I had that mentions a perpetrator of genocide. Now, mute me if you don't want to hear this. It was their words, not mine. So this is going to demonstrate selective inattention, no personal accountability for actions or views, a negative self-system and Moraean paradox or allowance for challenge. So I went to a wedding and I was the only person of the global majority in the room. I sat down as you do and, and talking to people and somebody come and sat next to me and said, what do you do? And I said, well, I do race and ethnicity and LGBT and I'm really enthusiastic about my job. 
because to me I have the best job in the world ever and I can only describe that I encountered a misogynistic racist homophobic attack in what I thought was a safe and brave space demonstrated through a verbal aggression and fear where somebody said to me fairly soon into a conversation I'm a persecuted straight white man I'm the modern equivalent to Hitler what do you say to that apart from go really that's that's your experience and they went on to say I had nothing to do with what my ancestors did I'm not apologizing or doing anything about it now you might think oh my goodness that's a terrible experience and it was but it's an experience that gets repeated in in spaces day in day out it wasn't years ago it was last month in the UK completely unprovoked you know I wasn't asking for apology I'm not I'm not asking them to speak for the whole of mankind just as I cannot speak for every person of the global majority we're just asking for assistance to dismantle the structurally embedded systems of discrimination both in within CNM and outside of it you know how something has always been needs to be challenged it needs to be raised in spaces where it has otherwise been suppressed and unfortunately until we challenge the default of whiteness in relational spaces conversations and attacks like that will continue to happen thank you so much for staying and listening this afternoon evening wherever you are thank you so much dana what a powerful way to finish and i'm really conscious of the fact that that's just the most recent experience that you've had and that it's constantly ongoing and yeah it's appalling um i i loved your talk i thought it was so interesting it brought up so many things for me and and um while our attendees are putting their questions in the q a and please do please do engage with zena um i I'm going to I'm going to challenge you on one thing. You totally don't apologize for infecting people with REM earworms. I know <laughs> that you're happy about that, so don't give me that. <laughs> Just try and deny it. Um, I'm also going to ask you a, a fairly easy um, question, I hope. You mentioned that there were Facebook, Facebook groups that you would recommend for people of the global majority who are consensually non-monogamous. Can you think of what any of them might be called? Just wondering if our attendees Ooh. might find that useful. On the spot, I think one's called Black Fluent. Okay. Um, and obviously there is Black and Polly. Um, there aren't that many spaces. That we have a couple of conferences every year in the UK. It's something that is growing in in popularity i'm seeing in fact i'm a relationship coach and the only couples that that i kind of see are those that are either exploring cnm or having issues with some facet of cnm so it's something that is rising in popularity people are beginning to think outside of monogamy is the only way forward and that's really important but what that brings with it is this in, internalized phobia we're very much still looking, because we've all been conditioned with it, very much looking at CNM through a monogamous lens. Yeah. And we need to deconstruct that. So you have these so you have so many layers. You have the intersectionality of trying to deconstruct monogamy and then the trying to deconstruct racism. You know, racism, I know Crystal mentioned racism. It, there's a, a Stonewall statistic that say 60% of black people have experienced racism from within the LGBTQIA plus community. Yeah, a community you know, that tries to congratulate itself on its, yeah. Yes, but even that has hierarchical structures within it. Yeah. So there needs to be a deconstructed because there has been everything that's been built, even those amongst you know cnm communities gsrd communities they've still been following the same model that built the structures that discriminate against people mm. 
that almost makes me think that it kind of circles back around to Yin's um, presentation at the start about completely deconstructing colonial hierarchies. Uh, and yeah. So I look. So Freud spoke about that kind of uh, radicalism, and and I and what I say to that is sometimes we have been so radical that we have ended up back at normativity. <laughs> when actually we didn't need to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think I saw somebody put their hand up, but, I'm, but they seem to have gone away. So if they could put their question in the Q&A, that would be fab. It's, it's difficult when you just see people putting their hands up and then it's just busy. Like, where did you go? What did you want? Tell me. <laughs> go um, while we're waiting for them, can you... Uh, can you? Uh, y- you're kind of going last, so my head's filled of sort of, with sort of Yin's stuff and Crystal stuff. I'm just wondering, how, can you speak to how the experience of people in the global majority in CNM communities in the UK might differ from the US? There's a different historical background. Obviously, there's different class issues at, at play. Can you contrast? your that community's experience with what crystal was talking about at all because because we have that class system we also still have that class system within minority communities and it's you have familial pressures you also have faith and religion pressures you have um ableism um for instance if you have uh, lots of these places and lots of, of clubs and meeting places are places that sell alcohol. So if you have had an alcohol and substance misuse issue in the past, you don't want to go to a pub. It's going to make you feel uncomfortable. So then you withdraw from the community and then you're not getting community support and you you know you face a higher risk of going into psychological distress. During um, when we were all isolated, I had I had clients who had returned home to their parents' house and got stuck there. So these were parents that that didn't know about CNM, you know, very often didn't even know about sexuality, gender. So people ended up going back into the closet effectively. And that caused that wet that put us into maintenance mode. So it was difficult to move forward when actually you have to just make it, you're just treading water, you're just trying to stay where you are. You know, because the scene is fragmented in the UK and, and you know, and I mentioned, look, I'm if, if somebody is in Oxford, then, OK, it's not far from London if you look on a map, but it could be a couple of hours each way. And I think as as the CNM and people interested in CNM grows, those pockets of people who are meeting, I think, is only going to grow, which means that there's going to be meets in different places. You know, I know there's one in um, uh, Nottinghamshire, there's one in Northampton. So, you know, I would look, have a look on Facebook um, for uh, places near you, you know, whether that is there. I know there's an Oxford uh, ENM group, I think it's called. So f- find some support. OK, are you going to go into those spaces as a person of the global majority and maybe not see anybody that looks like you? possibly so take some support with you Hmm. you know contact the organizers beforehand ask them how diverse their group is Hmm. yeah that's great advice that's very um that's very warm therapist advice actually it feels you know very sensible very helpful coping techniques (laughs) which a traumatized community needs really Yes, and, and, you know, we're only further traumatised by the notion of pathologization by, by some therapy and mod- modalities. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you as well for kind of linking back to this morning's discussions. Um, so it's been a, a lovely conference so far. Thank you very much, Zaina. Um, Thank you for inviting thank- me. 
<laughs> Thank you to all the attendees. Um, I hope you've enjoyed today. Um, I'd like to remind you that tomorrow um, the morning panel is about parenting paradigms and the afternoon will be a free form discussion where we'll be able to be a bit more interactive and connect with each other in that lovely uh, post-pandemic Zoomy way. Um, so we hope to see you there. Thanks very much from myself, Christian and Daniel. Thank you to all our speakers today. Thank you, Zaina. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Yin. And um, we are done and we hope to see you tomorrow morning. <laughs>